And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Milja, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from post-world games, a meh, a a man who may who may as well have the title of the king of the quick start, <laughs> and is and is now help and is now helping produce a re, a um revival of good guys finish last. The the one and only Jim Pinto. How you doing today, man? Uh, I am actually a little sick, but I'm gonna I'm gonna power through. I'm gonna power through today. All right. Um, is it just, is it, is it just seasonal or po or pollen stuff? I just. I have been working and writing so much. I haven't been sleeping, and today it just finally caught up to me, and it's punching me in the face and telling me to go rest. Ah. Well, I guess for fortunately, an interview isn't going to be as stressful as um as 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 as, in as intense writing and editing. So. No, no, yeah, this will this will be fine. I'm just going to sit here and let you do all the work. <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> so. This so good guys finish last. If I'm if, is a re-release of yes. the of the of the same name, and I think for a lot of people, myself included, this will be the first time that they've heard, that they've heard of it. So I would like you to kind of give kind of give the history of good guys finish last and how you came how you came across the project. Um. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I know a lot of people have never heard of it. In my opinion, it is the original story game. Uh, there's another game in the series called um, Crimson Cutlasses. It's a pirate game. Mm -hmm. And that one is extremely complicated with lots and lots of books. And it's dense. And it, I think it came first. But this is the one that I encountered before anything back in, I want to say, 91, 92. I went to my very first game convention. Mm-hmm. I found it there, and I immediately fell in love. I got to know the designers and developers, and uh, it just it caught me at the right age, and it just inspired me in so many ways. And I, I, uh, I ran into uh, Conrad actually at Gen Con about eight years ago. Mm -hmm. We hadn't seen each other or anything. He came by a booth when I was running it, and we got to talking and whatnot. And we exchanged information and we stayed in touch. And then two years ago, I said, hey, guys, you know, it's been too long since people have seen Good Guys Finish Last. The old edition is really faded and ugly. It just hasn't it hasn't kept up with how graphics appear nowadays. I'd like to re-release it. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is going to be my first intellectual property, my first licensed product from someone else. Yeah. Which which was a bit of a was a bit of a surprise um, from my perspective because for as long as I've known you, a lot of the stuff that you've put out has been um, has been your own thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I have to love this thing in order to do what I'm doing with it. I mm -hmm. would not, I would not just oh, Bob made a game. Let me put it under the post world games banner. I would never do that. So this is something I sought out after, and I I'm barely making any money on it. Right, mm -hmm. I'm doing this out of love. Most of the money is going to them, uh, and so I honestly, I, I just want people to get the game because I want them to play it and love it as much as I love it. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that you mentioned that in your opinion, this is the this is the first story game. Yeah. Um, in what in what ways do you, in what ways do you see um, Good Guys Finish Last to to be in that? And when it comes to when it comes to more more recent or or even less recent at the of um, story games, what would be its contemporaries in that regard? Um, I I think it in regards to how modern story games are played, it is probably most like Dogs in the Vineyard, or even Powered by the Apocalypse, mm -hmm. but much simpler. Uh, it puts a lot of the the main the main ingredient of the story games movement that appears in this game is it really was one of the first games to put so much agency in the player's hands to give them so much power over the story mm -hmm. um, with very little structure, very little rules and 
all of the flavor comes across in how you express and explain your powers, not in uh, a dense list of 5,000 powers that all kind of do the same thing. Yeah. So you have traits, and those two traits, two of those traits combine to form a power. And you might have a grid of, say, six or nine or 12 powers. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, based on all of these traits that you have, but you define what ballistic and chemical looks like. So that could be an acid gun or, you know, that could be little chemical grenades or that could be a mind power that you have where you fling um, toxic fumes at people or whatever, however you want to interpret it. Uh, the game effect is simple enough. You just roll 2d8, you look at a chart and that tells you your result based on your bonuses and everything else. Um, but you define it and you describe it within the framework of a comic book scene. Yeah. So you have a panel on a page and you're telling me what that panel looks like when you roll your dice. Mm-hmm. And just... games oh. didn't do that in 1990. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, obvi- obviously, obviously I'm only going to know so much from, from my own research, but from my understanding... The tre- the trend throughout throughout a good throughout a good chunk of the '90s was to go ridiculously crunchy. Um. Well, my re- recollection of the '90s is uh is that books were getting dense with mm-hmm. setting, and everybody was coming up with these unique maybe crunchy is a good word for it, but these unique dice systems that generally didn't work. Um. But they had these really these really developed settings fading suns comes to mind, right? Mm -hmm. It was just a repackaging of Dune, but they had their own world for it. And they ended up putting out 500 splat books for it. Um, Vampire was the one that led the charge on all of this. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they call that a storytelling game and not a story game, which is um, splitting a hair, I think, but had vampire had less dice involved and less stats. It probably would have been the first story game. Rather yeah. than storytelling game, um, uh, and I just had a conversation with Chris Klug about this, about mm-hmm. why people play Vampire a certain way while it's designed another way completely. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think with the story game movement, the most important thing that was coming out of it was agency and the player's ability to step away from what I call reliant focus play, where I roll a die and you tell me what it means. Right, mm-hmm. the game master's only role in a lot of role playing games is just to interpret the dice. Yeah. Um, and you, you finally start to see people getting away from that in the early two thousands where they say, what the hell do we need a game master for? Mm-hmm. I do. I do remember being, I do remember being in several discussions regarding, um, regarding GM list play. Um, and yeah, there's, and there's been plenty of games ever, ever since the two thousands that, um, that have it where the, where the, pl- where, uh, the players are the ones who are directing action, um, a case in point with this kind of thing is um, Cipher, where the GM doesn't roll anything. Right. Um. And I have a I have a game coming like that as well, mm-hmm. where it'll it'll be traditional role playing, but the game master doesn't roll dice at all. Yeah. Um. Now, when it I've um when it comes to when it comes to the whole two d eight and then lo- and then looking at a grid, whenever I when maybe maybe it's just maybe it's just um bad habits but whenever i hear um dice roll and then looking at a chart there's always there's always two games that come to mind and coincidentally both of them um are supers adjacent um obviously Mar- marvel phase rip is one is one of them <laughs> right right and the and the other one is dc heroes right and this is like neither of those but go mm-hmm. on um so what now both of th- both of them are both of them use a gri- use a grid setup, but they do it in different manners. Um, Phase Rip was doing degrees of success with a co- with a column based approach for its um, percentile roll, and while DC was also using two D ten, it wasn't using them in the the exact same way. Um, now w- now with with good with um good guys which I'm going to call for because I am not paid by the syllable I'd like you to expound a bit on on how the on how its particular power grid works 
Well, it's not so much a grid as, um, how do I describe it? It's just a, a reflection of what it is that you're trying to do, and then you have target values associated with it. Mm -hmm. But you're either going to get a mishap, a failure, a mixed result, or an overwhelming success kind of thing. So mm -hmm. there's only four results that you can get from rolling dice, but that's going to be based on what it is you're trying to do. Are you trying to do something that you're good at, or something you're not good at, and then, of course, you get bonuses to your die roll uh, based on you, the level, the bonuses of your traits. So uh, one of the things that I don't do when I'm designing is a lot of math, mm -hmm. right? I try to avoid games where you're rolling dice and then you're adding to it. But the structure of this requires that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not going to say that that's good or bad. I'm, that, that's not my, my place. This is what it is, and it's... it's uh, 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 it's very, very simple in every regard, except for the fact that you do have to do that little bit of math yeah. right right as you're rolling dice. But other than that, you're just looking at your results against the chart. Um, and so if you have a chemical of plus two and a ballistic of plus one, and you use them together, you're getting a plus three to your die roll. Mm -hmm. But if you're mixing your ballistic with your, let's say, energized, and that's a plus zero... You're not as good when you're doing energized chemical as you are with ballistic chemical. So, in the in that regard, when it comes to the when it comes to the character sheet itself, based on how you described it, is it a case where, um, where all roads lead to your lead to your choice of traits and how you're combining them? Yes, exactly. Um, so, and you're going to combine all of your traits into something, mm -hmm. but you may not have. When you mix your brawn and your chemical, if you have brawn, right? You don't have every trait. There's, I think, 11 now in the system. They've updated it since the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually, off the top of my head, can't remember how many are in it now. But it used to be eight. Um, so if you have brawn and chemical, as an example, um, that might be an acid punch, right? But that won't be useful if you're not in direct contact with a villain. So maybe that's your best stat, but you can't use it all the time. All right, I got I get I got gotcha. you. Now some now obviously obviously in plenty of games there's 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 the case, there's the case of some sort of some sort of ex some sort of caveat that can happen with certain with certain die results, whether it be whether it be criticals, glitches, what ha what have you? Is there anything like that with good guys? You, you faded out there for a second, so I missed some of that. Um, I was asking is that in a lot of in a lot of games, there's a um, set there's a setup regarding regarding cer regarding certain die results having a bit of a caveat, whether it be glitches or crit or criticals or botches, what what have you? Is there anything like that in good guys? There's the major mishaps. If you roll really, really poorly, something backfires on you. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, if this game were getting made today uh, and being redesigned from the ground up, the only change you would probably see in the game is the removal of the fail column from the game. Because games where nothing happens, where you roll a die and nothing happens, just aren't commonplace anymore. No. Uh, but... The rest of that is the stuff that we are very comfortable with still today, which is successes, mixed results, and major mishaps, which is straight out of... I mean, I mean that's that's powered by the apocalypse right there. Mm -hmm. That's nearly every die roll is a mixed result in Powered by the Apocalypse. And everything I'm doing in my new design, um, the one I just mentioned earlier, the traditional one, it's called Protean. Mm -hmm. I'm, that's all I'm doing is successes, mixed successes, and and mishaps right mm -hmm. i don't call them mishaps they're just major they're just critical failures yeah but i think that that is becoming a parlance that we're all comfortable with now in design and to to make that edit to this game would not be difficult to be honest you would mm -hmm. just get rid of the fail column and make everything a mixed result but i don't see that as being a necessity here i'm merely saying that if this were being redesigned today that would probably be the only change you would see made to it the ideas in it are so lasting. And again, they build the foundation. Whether it, people eat, that were making the story movement happen were aware of this game or not, doesn't matter. They had already solved these problems mm -hmm. in 1990. Yeah. So 
what we're seeing with games like Sorcerer and Polaris and Archip- Ar- uh, Archipelago and games that came out in the early 2000s that are starting the this movement, this story movement, their their ideas did exist before it. It's whether or not they felt themselves being influenced by those designs. Mm-hmm. Now, when it now when it comes now you mentioned you mentioned um, target numbers when it comes when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the approach, which right is where is where the is where the comparison to something like Powered by the Apocalypse is interesting because um that because that ga- because that game has a static set of target va- of target values for its degrees of success and the the main modifier is go- is going to be straight to the dice roll itself right in, in the hey. case go ahead go ahead in the case of good in the case of good guys what i'm curious about is is does it also have a does it also have a static approach when it comes to when it comes to the um tar- when it comes to the target number that you're trying to roll that you're trying to roll against or not n- no uh, there are four levels of degrees of difficulty mm-hmm. routine difficult tasking and limit um but it's essentially the same as any game where if i just threw a negative value at you okay you've got a negative 4 on your roll to try to accomplish this mm-hmm. um that that's essentially what these charts are. Uh, a routine a routine roll, you only need a six to get a success on two d eight. That's not difficult at all. Mm-hmm. But a limit is a fourteen or higher to get a success. Yeah. So if I'm trying to punch somebody into the sun, right? I'm Superman. I'm trying to punch somebody in the sun. I need a fourteen. Mm-hmm. But I'm Superman. I'm just trying to push an old lady across the street. I just need a six. All right. And you wouldn't even roll that for <laughs> Superman. But you get yeah. my point. Yeah, I got. I gotcha. Um. There's been there's been plenty of there's been plenty of instances throughout throughout superhero fiction of people being of people being especially when it comes to tech based heroes of using some sort of effect that ha- that has um, some degree of some degree of limitation whether whether it be the energy use that you might see with Iron Man where using Unibeam is gonna dra- is gonna drain him or something to that right. kind of extent um, is there something to replicate that in Good Guys? Your major mishaps, right? Whenever mm-hmm. you're rolling major his mishaps, that's the your opportunity for the referee, the game master, to say, okay, your that power cannot work now for the rest of the scene mm-hmm. until you've recharged your batteries, or, right, you've exhausted yourself and you've broken the bone in your hand, so you can't punch, you can't punch any more zombies. Mm-hmm. Now, when it now when it comes to when it comes to da- when it comes to damage, is damage that is damage something that would be treated as a um, pen- penalty to traits? Uh, that is certainly a way to interpret the system, but no. Uh, I really like the damage system in the game. The there are certain all of your traits in one way or another increase how much damage you can take, Mm -hmm. but you have fatigue, mental and vicious damage that you take. So where that, where those traits boost your ability to take damage is based on which column they go into. Mm -hmm. So your mental powers increase the amount of mental damage that you can take. Um, And you eventually get broken, right? If you take, Let's say you can only take three points of mental damage. When you get to that third one, you're broken and you can't fight anymore. But you'd have to be fighting somebody that does mental damage to worry about that. Mm. If you're just fighting a robot that punches, then your fatigue and your vicious are the cha- the columns you're going to have to worry about. Um, but everything, everything builds into these charts, right, into... Your, into your character sheet about how much damage you can take. Um, but that's all based on on your character build. All right. And it's one of the things I love about the game is, is how the damage works. Mm-hmm. Now, I'd like you to go into a bit about the th- about the three da- about the three damage types. I mean, I mean, obviously, 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 um, some you already mentioned mental, but what but um, what would be the dividing line between the between the other two aside from well, the obvious 
Yeah, well, fatigue is mm-hmm. you taking general physical damage, right? Mm-hmm. Getting punched, getting knocked into vehicles, falling down. Um, and then vicious is things, uh, things like energy attacks and acid and uh, electricity, any of the big superhero powers that you see in the Avengers, right? Mm-hmm. That's when you start taking vicious damage. Yeah. Now, a concept that I've seen I've seen get bandied about in the last few years, with especially especially within story games. Um, I think I think Fates talked about this. I think um, I think PBTA has, talk, has talked about this. Is the is what's been known as popcorn initiative, where initiative is not is not necessarily a a structured a structured count that everybody's rolling to determine turn order. But right. more of, but more of a, more of a passing the buck kind of thing until it inevitably gets passed back to the, to the um, GM. I, I'm not a fan of passing the buck or what you're calling popcorn initiative. Um, and this game does not do that. It's a little different. And again, pe- the people are doing this style. I'll get to it in a second. People are doing this style now, and these guys were doing it in 1990. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for me, I'm a big fan of fog of war initiative, and so you'll see that in my designs more often than the popcorn initiative. Yeah. Um, what I like to see in what, what this game does is that you decide if you want to go before or after the villain. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so it's, I don't remember what it's called before, but afterwards it's called reactive. And so, uh, and I've seen the reactive, the one where you go afterwards, I've seen that used to great effect when I've run this at conventions in the past. Because now the villain can't do anything to whatever it is you're doing afterwards. So if he's trying to get away, being reactive is your chance to stop him. Yeah. Right. But within the categories, within the 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 bands of whether or not you're um, going first or second, whether you're going before or after the villain, the players can generally decide what order they want to go in. Does that doesn't really matter? Mm-hmm. Uh, because if you're going before the villain, the villain can't stop what it is that you're doing. Yeah. And then the villain goes and you can't stop what he's doing unless you take reactive as your initiative. In its own way what you've described to me sounds sounds like it would it would fall into the category of a phase based um, turn order. Um the thing that the thing that comes to mind when it comes to other games that would use that um one of the big ones these days of course is Shadow of the Demon Lord does that. Even if it's even if it's not doing it in the exact same way as Good Guys is, and um, of course Role Role Master, and now it's now it's um retro and its recent retro clone against the Dark Master, um, kind of ha- kind of has its own take on a f- on a phase based approach. Even if that one's more crunchy because well it's Role right. Master, <laughs> right? But I do find I do find that interesting because e- because. Across, across across gaming generations there's been, there's there's still there's still the idea that that everybody rolls for initiative as a as a static thing to the point where roll for initiative has become has become a has become a um a proj- a pejorative in and of itself yeah 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 absolutely I, my my first business card said the world ends roll for initiative right because it's such a colloquialism within our community everybody knows what it is Mm -hmm. even though i think it's one of the worst things in gaming i think it has taught us so many bad habits um that uh, essentially i think dnd third edition is is ruined by the initiative system It, it is the thing that makes it the least fun that's my personal opinion yeah i i can i can cert i can certainly um I can certainly see. I can certainly see it. I know. I know some people swear by that initiative. Although the question I've always asked is, are you swearing by that because 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 it's what you actually want to do, or is it be, or is it or or is it a case of we do it this way because we've always done it this way because this is the way we do it. Right. And if that right. if that sentence sounded if that sentence sounded ridiculously circular, that's the point. <laughs> um. I, I think what ends up happening is you the, you have something like the structure of third edition's initiative, and in theory, on paper, when you're creating it, you're thinking, "Oh my God, I'm solving all these problems," but you're still fo- solving problems within the box and framework that initiative has always been problematic 
within anyway. I realize that was a complicated sentence. Mm -hmm. But in order to solve initiative, you have to throw out the entire system and start anew. You can't just say, oh, so here's how we're going to solve initiative. We're going to use a D 1D20 because everybody knows what 1D20 is. And then we're going to do this, 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 this. Yay, we fixed it. Well, no, you didn't. You just found new math to do what you've been doing. That's not actually a solution. Yeah. And so it's the same. If you were to try to solve anything with D&D, &D, right, you have to step outside the framework and say, what is it about this that we are still holding on to? Why is charisma still a stat? Why are any of these attributes still ranked 3 to 18? Why does that make any sense at all? Um, um, if we're going to fix these things or actually quote unquote design them because design is about choices mm -hmm. if you're going to do that you have to ask bigger questions and for me it's always been well if i'm going to fix initiative i'm going to go with this for fog of war system that i've been using at my tabletop for 20 years and i'm just going to pop publish that and that's yeah. in a number of my games mm -hmm. you can find it yeah now when it now one thing that you brought that you brought up on the kickstarter page for good guys is the idea of ta the idea of taking the roles of authors as well as characters. Yes. Um, I would like you to go. I would like you to go into what to what that entails and how that and how that differs from other role playing games in general and other superhero games in particular. Uh, well, one of the things that you're going to do is you're going to talk. You're going to do what I was talking about earlier, which is you're going to describe the panel that you're fighting in, right? Mm -hmm. And together, you're making the issue happen. You're deciding how it's opening. What what important thing from this scene is going to go onto a page? Is this going to be a splash page? Um, where is the title going to go? That sort of thing. And you don't have to get into all the nuts and bolts that you if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. But the rule book actually deals with things like uh, lagging sales. Is your comic not doing well because the stories are getting repetitive? Um and so you as players get to be authors and publishers and whatnot and say, we're going to bring in a guest artist. Mm -hmm. And that's just sort of, you know, it's 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 a colorful flavor for the uh, for the issue. But then how does that impact how you're going to play this session? How is that going to how are you going to bring that that kind of agency into and that kind of metagaming into the story? Mm hmm. And, of course, you can ignore all that and just play it as a straight superhero game. There's nothing to stop you from doing that. Um, but it is those details. We, I remember we played at a convention once where the very first thing we did was sit down and say, do we have the budget to hire uh, a guest artist for this issue? Mm -hmm. Before we did anything, that was the question that came up from one of the players. Because they had played before and they knew how it worked. Mm -hmm. And then somebody started sitting down and actually started sketching out what the first page looked like and so forth so on and so forth so we really got into that part of and i should point out by the way i've played this game about a hundred times over the years when in the when in its nascent days i was playing this all the time mm -hmm. so i have a lot of these kinds of stories of what we were doing with the system but when you get people together who know how the game works and they know what they want to get out of it you can get these kind of experiences um and you really don't even need the book to help you. You you already know, oh, what's something that comic book people have to deal with? Oh, well, the writers and the artists aren't getting paid enough. How are we going to get this into more stores? How are we going to increase readability? So on and so forth. So if you want to deal with that part, you can. Yeah. Now, give, now given what given what you given what you mentioned, um I'll say I'll use the I'll use the guest artist thing that you brought, thing that you brought beforehand as a um, as an as an example to to expand on. Um, would 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 something like that be ma be mainly pr present in the narrative or with th things like get things like guest artists or writer and writer and editor issues? Would there be some mechanical influence in that? There's really I. No, there's no mechanical influence. It's just, it's just a little bit of flavor that you're putting into the game at the beginning and the end mm -hmm. of the session. It's, um, it's sort of, it's sort of like sitting around the campfire and talking about the story you just told. Sort of moments, but it's it's formalized for the purpose of this game because you are in fact not just playing in it but also writing it. All right. 
and with a lo- with a lot of um with a lot of supers games that I that I've seen o- that I've seen over the years, um, some there's there's been plenty of att- there's been plenty of attempts to either to either tr- either try and encompass the entirety as as broad of a uh, net as you can with the with the eras of comic books, and there's and there's some that tr- there's some that try to go for something a little more specific. Um, would you say that good guys is more in the is more in the category of the former? Where it's tr- where it where it's something that is trying to encompass um, a variety of different ages. Um, I think that it. Hmm, that's a really great question. I I think the art of the game has always spoken to the indie publishing side of comic books. the The tone of the game has always felt that way. Um, I've commissioned all the new art. And so I've tried to give it a more four color fantasy approach mm-hmm. and a lot tighter, like tighter line work than we've seen previously in the, in the game. Um, so uh, I hope the visuals are, are certainly improved over what we've seen before, yeah. but the power grid seems to speak to uh, that middling range. There's Superman wouldn't fit in this game, right? His stats mm-hmm. would be so ridiculous. There'd be no point in rolling. The charts aren't built for that. So this is this is Captain America. This is the space between Captain America and and not Thor, but Captain America and Iron Man. Right. That's sort of the power range we're talking about. And that speaks to a specific era mm-hmm. pat post gold and silver age of comics, I think. Bronze Age. Yeah. Um since you mentioned that I, I will admit that there is a there's a bit of it when it comes to when it comes to examining um superhero motifs there's i um now obviously the the um the tiering setup that the big two have is is on is two is two different setups the approach that i've used and i've often used this whenever i write a primer for a supers campaign is the is a scale system that i have um the bot the bottom then this does, is the is the street scale these are people these would these would be characters who focus on a specific neighborhood in a sit in a city or a or a smaller or a smaller city as a whole. A lot of the street level characters from the big two would qualify would qualify under this. Um, the above above that is the is the city t- is the city scale. Um, characters who tend who tend to be guardians of over an entire over an entire city an entire an entire state. Or a or a large or a much larger region, um, and ab- above that is pl- is planetary scale, and above that is interplanetary. You get the idea. Where right. would right, uh, yeah, yeah. where would good where would good guys fit into that particular scaling system? I think that that the beauty there is that the game master gets to really decide that, and the players get to decide that. I've mm-hmm. always run it as you're part of an international agency and you're trying to solve world problems. You work for the UN kind of thing, Mm -hmm. but I was a college student. And so I think a lot of my idealism was playing into how I ran the game, but there's no reason you couldn't be playing daredevil and Spider-Man on street level solving neighborhood crimes. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that fits in really well with the game. It, it just limits the scope of the, the nemeses, the villains in the story that that you can bring into play so because because the the villains really define the scope um things like giant robots don't feel like neighborhood problems and so i think i think you as the game master end up defining that by the types of villains you have the players fight because that is one of your roles as game master, right? The players don't write in the villain. You make the villains. You make the plots. You make the problems. Mm-hmm. The players are just filling in the gaps in the narrative that where they can fill in the gaps where there are no secrets. And to be fi- to be fair, when it com- when it comes to the approach that the approach that you mentioned of a group of a group solving problems, given that th- given that this was early '90s. That is completely apropos given what given what was turning heads around that time, right, right. Um, because this what this was the, the 
we're t we're talking we're talking er we're talking early nineties on on this, right? So yeah. that that would mean that we're in, that would mean that we're in the um a lot of a lot of the golden ages of of t of team up projects being being the big movers, and of course the of course the massive explosion of the of the X Men around that time, where they and <laughs> and several others where I think I think the whole, I think the whole X series had like half a dozen different um, books around that time. The bu the speculator bubble hadn't burst yet. That wouldn't happen for a yeah. few years. Yeah. So taking taking that taking that approach is at that particular time makes sense. Um. Now what? Now speaking of that, when it comes when it comes to when it comes to adversaries. Whether whether they be whether they be low level mooks or the, or the or ma or massively egotistical mega villains, um, I love alliteration. Wh huh? Do would they be would they be created in a way similar to the way player characters are created, or do they or do they have a separate um approach? They it's very similar, but it's not identical. Um, you're going to pick their major uh, just attack forms, right? You don't have to go through every step. Mm -hmm. You're going to pick their traits. You're going to pick their attack forms. You're going to pick what they're invulnerable to. Um, but it's a much more simplified version of a character because you're only getting the ingredients you need to have them fight once or twice. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, gu I'm guessing. I'm guessing there's. A, I'm guessing that there's a bit of a tier setup so that. So that you don't end up running into mooks that are just a little are just a little bit too tanky for what they're supposed to be doing. Right. Well, yeah. I, when you're throwing just generic henchmen at the villains at the at the at the heroes, you're going to send them in waves, right? And that you might have ten of them surround a guy, mm -hmm. but collectively they still just roll brawn plus two right because yeah. it represents that they're overwhelming somebody mm -hmm. you're not going to roll for every single individual one that's tiresome and and unfun mm -hmm. especially especially since if we're if you're dealing with the more higher end um forms of super forms of supers especially with how there's how they're seen in in a lot of well in both comic books and in and in films um you're probably not going to be throwing just 10 mooks you're probably going to be throwing a hundred and that's a conservative right. number, <laughs> right? Right. And of course, all of that's based on how many people are at the table playing, too. Mm -hmm. Right. If you're running this at a game convention like I used to do all the time, we had five, six people playing at the table, and so that's a lot of superpowers going around, and you've got to challenge all of those people on different terms. Um, but if you're just running for two or three of your friends, you're going to have different. Your games are going to have a different scope. Yeah. Um, what would you say? Would you say that there's that there's a certain number that's a that's a happy medium when it comes to the amount of um, players? I know some games have that, where they where they may prefer having um, having a ha having a handful instead of a ma instead of too many. Um, uh, I I've actually run this game for thirty six people before Jesus. at a giant at a giant invitational on a Monday morning at a game convention. Um, were you the only GM doing character... that? What's that? Were you the only GM at the ta at the table? No, we there were a couple of us, and we were taking on different groups. Um, but we told this big story that could involve all of them. They were summoned to this Beyonder planet kind of thing, right? Secret War style, mm -hmm. and they had to deal with everything that was going on there. But we kept them occupied and busy, and because all of them knew how to play the game, because they had played earlier in the weekend. They had been invited to the session and they knew what they were doing. And so I don't know how to answer what the sweet spot is. If you don't, if you have players that don't know what they're doing there, every extra one of those detracts from play. Um, and so I think D and D can handle 12 players. If all 12 of them are paying attention and know how the game works, but it just takes one narcissist at any game table playing on their phone instead of engaging in the game to completely ruin it even if there's just two players playing um so lo short answer is i don't know three to six mm -hmm. longer answer is any number of good players yeah and i i um 
for me for me my, for me the ha for me the happy medium for me is um is four is four um yeah yeah I, that's that's a great size i can i can do i can do i can do five it's it's kind it's kind of pushing it i'd prefer i'd prefer if i'm doing five i'd need i need people on i need um every everybody on relative board because of how i operate Six is really pushing it, and anything beyond that, um, if I'm doing if I'm doing that many, I expect payment. <laughs> or at the or at the yeah, very yeah, yeah, yeah. at the very least a at the very least a second GM to help to help manage the workload, so I'm not at, so I'm not Atlas holding the whole world up. Uh, my buddy Mike and I used to run uh, a specific D and D scenario at a local con, and it was for five players. But there were so many villains in it that Mike would sit there and run the combat of the villains, and I would just administer the game. And that that seemed to work out really, really well because we both knew the rules very well for third edition, and it kept things moving. And I think that's the most important ingredient when you're doing this is just to keep things moving. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot to do and say on your turn in Good Guys. Um, so you should be able to... Declare what you want to do, roll your dice, describe the action frame, and move on to the next person's action within a minute, right? So uh, if you, everybody's involved and clicking and their gears are, are moving, then, again, any number of people work so long as everybody's involved and paying attention. Mm -hmm. It is a game where you have to listen. It is a game where you have to know what other people are doing so that you can build on the canon of the story. Um, and I don't think D and D operates that way. That way. And when it comes to now, when it comes to advancement within um, good within good guys, mm -hmm. um, is that is that handled is that handled mainly on a GM's call kind of thing, or is or uh, is there a codified no, it, system? No, it has an amazing advancement system, and I don't know. Honestly, don't know if I want to give it away. With, because I'd rather people have to pay to see it, but it is one of my favorite advancement systems in role-playing games. Anything the better games, that was the company that released it. Anything they made used this, this, uh, this experience system. And so the game master has no control over when you advance. It's all based on you. Uh, I, I love the advancement system. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then when you get an advancement, you get a plus one to one of your traits. Mm -hmm. So. And from the way you mentioned it earlier, it sounds like advance, advancing your traits is also going to advance your um, durability. Right. Right. Exactly. Um. So with with that, I'm getting. I'm guessing that I'm get. Is it a case where each trait will will um make clear which um durability it's going to be advancing, or is yes. that? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's all on the chart. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I have the book open right now. I I'm, I want to be able to tell you exactly what page it is. But I don't know. I think it's forty or something. Mm -hmm. um, but everything is uh, 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 everything is. There's a huge walkthrough on everything in the book. It takes its time. Here it is, page twenty-eight. Tells you how overflow works on damage and everything else. Mm -hmm. Now, with now with all that with all that in mind. Now knowing you, knowing you and how and how you do these quick starts. So. As I so as I, under, I understand it, the the book is the book is already done. You're just tr you're just trying to get some more um, art together, correct? Uh, yeah, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know I when it came when it came to the text from the old version of the new one, were was it was it mainly just cl just um clean just cleaning it up just cleaning it up. That was that was done, or were, were there were there some things that had to be um look be looked at with a bit more detail? I am trying my best not to change too much of their text. Mm -hmm. There are times where they make fun of champions, and I'm asking myself the question: Do I want to keep this in here? Um, but and there's also times because it's written in the '90s, right? There's this very um male gaze approach to writing that we don't really do anymore. So I have to go through and think about those sort of things, but the game itself, I don't, I haven't had to tinker with anything mm -hmm. like that. It's really just flavor. Am I going to, if I, am I really going to mess with what they've written here? Yeah. It's their voice. It's their game. I'm just publishing it. 
Mm-hmm. So I don't know how much I really want to tinker with. I I got gotcha. you, and I'll cer- I'll certainly be ke- I'll certainly be keeping a close eye on how on how it de- on how it develops. So so the as I understand as I understand it, it's there's nine di- at the time of this recording there are nine days left on the on the Kickstarter. Um, you're getting j- you're getting pr- just you're just under five thousand with it. And yeah. congratulations on getting funded in twenty minutes. Yeah. Um, wh- now, within the, when it comes to the one, there was one th- particular thing that I fa- that I found kind of um, kind of amusing with the um, backer tiers, and I usually I usually don't cover um, backer tiers because it's something that anybody can just look at, but I was curious what. What prompted you to um, put in the two fifty one tier? I was uh, I was going through. There's some text that's missing from their text documents, mm-hmm. and I had to go through my old books. Luckily, I still had them to retype them from scratch. And when I opened up the old, and this thing is over thirty years old. This this copy of the game that I have, I found all my old notes for the campaign that I ran at my local game store and for uh, the group, the, the group of characters that I made for introductory play at a convention. And I just, I said, okay, I, this might be interesting to somebody. And so mm-hmm. I just thought somebody's going to want this. And sure enough, somebody did. Yeah. And uh, it's certain, it's certainly good. It's certainly going to be a, it's certainly going to be an interesting for for whoever gets that at that tier is going to be an interesting look at um i was going to make a diary of a madman joke but i think that's a little too obvious <laughs> um but with but with all that said i do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come come all the way up to the temple yeah i am again sorry about that <laughs> it's the second time this week i screwed up time zones mm-hmm yeah, no, no, wor- no worries, man. Um, and anytime you see fit to return, as always, the do- the door is open. Um, as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of co- and of course, I would be remiss if I did if I did not give my thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>